Friends, let's take our Bibles, the ones that you brought with you, the ones that uh, are in the pew, the one that are, you have an electronic device, and let's share together in the reading of this, the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 4, <clears throat> verses 12 through 23. Matthew chapter 4, and starting with verse 12, and here's where Jesus begins his ministry. Now when, Jesus, now, when Jesus heard that John had been arrested, he withdrew to Galilee. He left Nazareth and made his home at Capernaum by the sea in the territory of Zebulun and the Folly, so that what had been spoken through the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. Land of Zebulun, land of Nephali, on the way, on the road by the sea across the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people who sat in darkness have seen a great light, and for those who sat in the region and shadow of death, light has dawned. From that time, Jesus began to proclaim, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. As he walked by the sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fish for people. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. As he went from there, he saw two other brothers, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, in the boat with their father Zebedee, mending their nets, and he called them. Immediately they left their boat and their father and followed him. Jesus went throughout Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and curing disease and every sickness among the people. This is the word of God for the people of God, and we say together, thanks be to God. Let us pray. Holy and merciful God, indeed, we are grateful for this time that we have, that as we indeed gather and gather in your name, we gather to, to know you, to love you more, to understand who we are in relationship to you. And so let this service of worship be that learning for us, but also our giving thanks and praising you and just seeking to love you more. In your name and for your sake we pray. Amen. You like history? I do. Uh, I try to learn some history every place I serve. I try to learn a little bit of history in every place I've ever served over the years. And, and one of the things that I found very fascinating about here in Marion is that Marion is named for Brigadier General Francis uh, Marion, known as the Swamp Fox, who served during the French and Indian War and the Revolutionary War. And it was during the Revolutionary War that he used irregular warfare against the British and was considered one of the fathers of guerrilla and maneuver warfare. And these tactics are operational principles by which the U.S. Army Rangers use as part of their understanding and operation. That's, that's pretty neat. When the Spanish explorer Hernando Cortez landed at Veracruz, Mexico in 1519, he was intent on conquest. After they unloaded the ships, after months of travel, to assure the devotion of his men, Cortez set fire to the eleven ships. With no means of retreat, Cortez' army only had one direction to move, and that was forward, into the interior of Mexico. He had completely eliminated any option of going back, and at the same time, had, in, had created a very uh, powerful motivation to succeed. It was an all-or-nothing enterprise. Option the option of failure, well, was not an option. They couldn't get back on the ships and go home. It was really a succeed or die approach. 
what would it take for us to get beyond you know excuses and achieve the goals of a church of being the body and being disciples so as to make disciples Jesus was born in Bethlehem which fulfilled the prophecy that was said about the Messiah the family uh, Mary and Joseph and Jesus fled Israel to Egypt because Herod was hunting for Jesus um, after Herod's demise the family then returned to Israel they settled in Nazareth and in doing so this was a fulfillment of prophecy Matthew then tells uh, tells us that Jesus uh, was living in Capernaum and his earliest days of his adult life and his ministry were spent at Capernaum and minister in in for, for Matthew, Matthew says that Jesus, the early days of ministry, he was a bit of a, a itinerant preacher and uh, something of a constant wanderer across the land. It's in Capernaum that Jesus picks up with the proclamation of John, the proclamation being, repent for the kingdom of God is near. And it's in this moment as Matthew describes it it's in this time that the power of Jesus the power of Jesus call becomes quickly evident the call upon his first followers was uh, profound you know Jesus doesn't have to go up and pitch an idea he doesn't have to go out and be very persuasive he just goes up and he says Come follow me, and they come. These early uh, apostles, they didn't have much reason to leave their current situation. I mean, they had family ties. They had a job that was decent and was keeping them comfortable. But the power of call was overwhelming and could not be ignored. Having begun to assemble the disciples, Jesus turns to His work. He preaches in the synagogue. He pronounces the good news of the kingdom. He makes the sick and the unwell whole. Teaching, proclaiming the kingdom, and healing are the chief components of Jesus' ministry. In Jesus, the reign of God had dawned not only because... Jesus had spoken into existence, but because He showed it in action, in the teaching, in the preaching, and in the healing. Jesus proclaimed the kingdom of God because He was the embodiment of the kingdom of God. He gave a call to Simon, then his brother Andrew, then to James and John, and they were to engage to repent, to follow, to take part in this reshaping effort that God was about. This reshaping effort that God was doing. That Jesus, with the call, had invited the disciples to do just that. Be engaged in that reshaping effort. Call is such an important part of our understanding in being the family of God. Ministry is the work of the whole church, not just a select few. All who seek to follow Jesus, all who say, I follow Jesus, all are called to ministry. And the variety of gifts are given by the Holy Spirit so that ministry can take place. And because all are called, because... The Holy Spirit gives those gifts. So then it is that the body, the church, must be organized for effective action. So that all in the body, you and me, all watching online this morning, all of us recognize that we are called. 
and our living into that call is done by practicing our faith. From the book, Odd and Wondrous Calling, says this, Practicing our faith is like a dance. We are called to dance together, not just with those we meet in this life, but with a cloud of witnesses and a slew of saints from our past and our future. Our calling as followers of Jesus is to see and interact with the lost, the last, and the least. We know it in our heart that they are children of God, just as you are children, a child of God, just as I am a child of God. That they are claimed and loved, just as you are claimed and loved, just as I am claimed and loved. But the lost, the last, and the least, they are your brothers and sisters. They are my brothers and sisters. When Paul, the Apostle Paul, urged folks at the church at Rome, he said to them, put on Christ. He was asking the readers of that letter to take on, to assume some of the qualities of Jesus. They would wear those qualities as they would like new and ill-fitting clothes. And they would wear them until someday those clothes fit. They were broken in. And then those new clothes, putting on Christ, would be the expression of who they had become. Our understanding of call comes from the Bible. People were called of God to a specific ministry or service. Paul was called by God to be an apostle. The Old Testament priests were called by God for their special work. God called the entire nation of Israel to be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Uh, the church, redeemed by the blood of Jesus, is similarly, similarly called... You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God, and they will reign on the earth, says Revelation. Because God's call is active and real, and in our present, it shows that God is very much more a part of our universe than we ever thought before. God is active in the now. We are called by God to salvation, to know Jesus, to follow Him. We are called to grow further in virtue and serve God by good works. In fact, this is the, the, the maturing process that comes with a calling of God. That we grow up into our call. Grow into it. Every person who says, I want to know Jesus, I want to follow Him, every single person that says that has a call on their life. As Ephesians puts it, we were designed before the foundation of the world to be His, God's, workmanship, glorifying Him as we bring forth the fruit He desires. And the urge and the gnawing within to have a burden for a particular area or a particular need that relates to the kingdom of God. This is a call. And and the call is expressed in different ways. Some are called to political areas of life. Some are called... To, to be engaged in things like ending trafficking, human trafficking. Others are called to be pastors and teachers and worship leaders and Bible translators. Others are called to come alongside those with addiction and help them in recovery. And I think that, that, that understanding, that sense of call, spills over into such areas as teaching and law enforcement and fire and rescue and funeral service and medicine. The story goes of a young nursery worker in a church that just had a, a, a deep abiding love for kids. 
she sees the, a video is shared in church. She sees kids uh, languishing in an orphanage in Romania. She loves small children, and she, and what she learns, what she sees, it, it just pierces her heart. She's compelled to learn more. So she seeks out more information, educates herself, and, and as she does, that burden for that orphanage in Romania just grows stronger. She begins to pray for direction. She asks God, am I supposed to do something about this? She discusses what's going on in her. She discusses it with her pastor. She discusses it with her spiritual mentor. She asks a Bible study group that she's involved in to pray with her about the matter. And so she contacts the organization that she saw, this church organization that she saw, that operates the orphanage in Europe. And she learns from them that they have an opening for a worker. She felt this seems to be a confirmation of sorts, but she, seemed, she, she continues to ask God for wisdom. And then a relative sends her money because she feels compelled to do so, and it is the amount that she will need in order to make the trip to Romania. With all these avenues confirming a decision, it is then she feels confident to move forward in God's call. And she goes to Romania to help the orphans and to glorify God. One way we understand a calling is that all followers, all who follow Jesus, all of us are called to be examples of God's love. All of us. After the resurrection, Jesus was busy tying up loose ends in instruction and in training the disciples so He could send them into the world so that they could establish the church. And they were ready to go to share the good news and to be examples of God's love. Their eagerness and their willingness was a further confirmation of this, this power that Jesus had in the calling that they were going to trust in God for the next steps that came. And so it is, through the centuries, we have been called. We have been called. We are called. Not all necessarily to be, to be pastors or professional religious, but all of us, all of us, all of us here this morning, all of us watching online, we are all called to be examples of God's love. All of us. We're called to engage and be a part of things. And we might say, well, you know, I just, I just don't have the time. I mean, my schedule is as such. It's just whew, pretty busy. But if we really rethink our priorities, if we really think about it, we can find the time. We need to find the time. The heart. What's going on in the heart? What the Holy Spirit is doing in the heart will compel us to do so. Part of our effort with Care, Claim, and Connect is to, is to look at the bulletin, uh, read the newsletter, uh, visit the website and take part. Food and fellowship, food pantry, children's ministry, youth ministry, music ministry. There are avenues that we want to explore in, in connecting more with our homeless community, our homeless population. There are uh, deepening relationships we want to, to continue to deepen with Marion Correctional. In all these things, we are living into that call to share and show Jesus to our family and friends, our neighbors, our community, and the world. What does it mean to, to live out a call? 
For me, the discerning part was hard. I went to college with every intention of, of trying to become an FBI agent. I wanted to be in, in law enforcement. That door closed. And then I looked at being a teacher, teaching uh, secondary education. That door closed. And all the while, in the backdrop of those pursuits, was um, operating in my mind and heart, was the exploration to ex- you know, explore ministry. Be involved in exploring ministry. And the exploration of ministry led to confirmation upon confirmation upon confirmation. And so I understood I was called to be a pastor. And especially then, but even now, I'm like, really? Me? God, you want me for this? You know, the schooling and the training was easy compared to what wakes me up some nights. Wake up asking this question, God, how do I live this call authentically, faithfully, meaningfully? And some nights still not going to sleep, going, God, do I live this call authentically, faithfully, meaningfully? The clip we're about to see sets a pretty high bar. But I share it with you for inspiration and encouragement. That as we think about our call, if we ask God to help us with our call, because we're all called. I share it with you in that spirit of inspiration. And encouragement. Let's watch the clip. I am a part of the fellowship of the unashamed. I have Holy Spirit power. The die has been cast. I have stepped over the line. I am a disciple of His. I won't look back, let up, slow down, back away, or be still. My past is redeemed. I'm finished with low living, sidewalk, smooth knees, colorless dreams. Visions, mundane talk and dwarf goals. I don't have to be right, first, top, recognized, praised, regarded, or rewarded. I now live by faith, lean on His presence, walk by patience, lift by prayer, and labor by power. My faith is set, my gate is fast, my goal is heaven, my road is narrow, my companions few, my guide reliable, my mission is clear. I cannot be bought, compromised, detoured, lured away, turned back, or delayed. I will not flinch in the face of sacrifice, hesitate in the presence of the adversary, or negotiate at the table of the enemy. I won't give up, shut up, let up, until I have stayed up, stored up, prayed up, paid up, preached up for the cause of Christ. I am a disciple of Jesus. I must go until he comes, give till I drop, preach till all know, and work till he stops me. And when he comes for his own, he will have no problem recognizing me. My banner will be clear. We answer the call and we burn the ships and leave the old ways behind. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. Let's pray. Holy and loving God, how wonderful you are. How great you are. So now, uh, give to us by your Spirit this greater, deeper, better understanding of call that we would live into it, grow into it, be examples of love to this world and that you would move and work in us as a church and as individuals to share you with the world to the least, the last, and the lost. 
In your name we pray. Amen.